everyone, welcome to tonight's class. Tonight we're going to be focusing on fintech and our table of contents today. We're going to start with a fintech lecture that I'm going to lead with you. And the news is about as fresh as it can be. Some of these slides have news that is up to 12 hours old. So it's about as new as it gets. Uh, then we are going to be having two student-led discussions, uh, one on lightning by Susan Buchanan and then Josh Lind is going to be leading one on what is commerce, what is the Chamber of Digital Commerce. If we have time left over, uh, we're going to ask Paul to uh, lead some parking lot questions if we have time for that. We, we might have right. some minutes for that. And before I start my lecture, just for Susan and Josh, as well as everyone else who's going to be doing a student-led lecture, uh, part of what we're going to be looking for is how much you engage the students within your breakout room. So I'd encourage you during the lecture to think of provocative questions that are going to get people discussing things, where people are going to be taking positions. For example, dilemma questions will get a lot of hands raised. Uh, also ones that create strong opinions of yes or no, and try to just engage people on the pro, con, agree, disagree side, just so that we can get a, a round basically round robin of opinions. And uh, we tend not to have a problem with class participation in this group at all. So you shouldn't worry about it. But uh, sometimes student led discussions have a lot of crickets in the room, no one's saying anything. Feel free to call on people and let them know ahead of time I'm going to be calling on people. Uh, but also to help out the person giving that presentation, uh, please participate more actively than normal so that uh, we don't have a lot of silence because this is going to be graded for everyone and then they'll will be returning the favor as well. Okay, so let's start off with FinTech. And for starters, I'm going to be doing a 60 second mini review on blockchain and its relevancy to FinTech and I have a short video to start us off with. The blockchain is one of the most promising new technologies for the future. So what is it? It's a distributed ledger technology that underlies cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and provides a way to record and transfer data that is transparent, safe, auditable and resistant to outages. The blockchain has the ability to make the organizations that use it transparent, democratic, decentralized, efficient and secure. The blockchain is likely to disrupt many industries in the coming 5 to 10 years. These are some of the industries it's already disrupting. Number 1. Banking and Payments some people say that the blockchain will do to banking what the internet did to media. Blockchain technology can be used to give access to financial services to billions of people around the world, including those in third world countries who don't have access to traditional banking. Technologies like Bitcoin allow anyone to send money across borders almost instantly and with very low fees. Abra is a startup that is working on Bitcoin based remittance services. And many banks like Barclays are also working on adopting blockchain technology to make their business operations faster, more efficient and secure. Banks are also increasingly investing in blockchain projects and startups. IBM predicts that about 15% of banks will be using the blockchain by the end of 2017. Okay. So basically from a high altitude, the consumer is going to be benefiting from blockchain in the finance space by getting increased customer trust, and they're going to be having an enhanced banking experience, which is basically the way you can look at what fintech is going to be doing on the consumer end is that it greases the engine. Things are going to be running a lot smoother and faster and more seamless. Uh, same thing is going to be happening on the commercial side. The back office really gets the wheels greased where things move faster, a lot of manual processes go away, things speed up and get cheaper. And because of this, some new business opportunities come into play in fintech because some markets that were too expensive to get into now become approachable, especially the unbanked communities. And here's a handful of the industry benefits that we're going to be enjoying in fintech. More efficiency, trust is going to go up, you're going to have more transparency and information. And then we're going to move on to, these are the three frictions that blockchain and finance is going to be helping out with. The first one is on the interaction side where it can decrease transaction costs. You reduce the degrees of separation between a transaction, meaning you have less transactions. 
on the information side, uh, you're going to be getting <coughs> information that stops becoming siloed, so everyone gets to see the same thing at the same time instead of waiting around for information and having it be disconnected. And then on the innovation side, you have restrictive regulations that we still have to be mindful of, uh, which some of the blockchain purists are not going to be happy about. But we're also going to be able to deal with some invisible threats, specifically new startups coming into the space against the more established banks. So here's some of the specific benefits on friction reduction. Uh, on the faster side, you're going to be looking at transactions that can settle in minutes versus days. For example, I have my Harvard 403B at Vanguard, and when I buy a stock or put money into it, it's like watching honey drip on a hot day as it moves through the balance process. So the money comes in, and then it gets debited from my checking account. And it, it allows me to buy the stock that day, but two days later, the cash actually comes in. And then there's another day or two before it actually will hit the account and then watch it settling out. And if you look at the performance on the Vanguard account, once you buy a stock before the cash has been covered, it looks like it was this massive loss. So your equity curve goes all over the place. However, if you buy Bitcoin, which I have before uh, through my Coinbase account, which makes Adam cringe, that's okay, Adam. I'm getting better with it. Uh, it settles in like a second. It's just super fast. So there's, there's some joy in that. On the efficiency side, uh, a lot of manual processes are going to be going away. A lot of paper that we see uh, can get digitized. And I'm just going to mute Bill for a second because I'm hearing his keystrokes. On the digital side, uh, digital paper, paper is going to get digitized, which that's going to make things much faster. Uh, on the security side, I was actually in a hackathon at MIT on secure digital identity, so we'll be digging a little bit into that, where there's some really interesting things that they are doing with digital identity, especially with stopping redundancy, such as when you go to the airport and you have to show your ID four or five times, and at the fourth or fifth time you feel like saying, hey, how did I get this far if I hadn't shown my ID beforehand? So that's going to start to go away. And on the global side, you're going to start to have a better increase in cross-border payments, which really helps people who are living in the United States who have family back home, and they want to send money back home, typically through Western Union. So they're going to get a real leg up on fintech. So for industry expansion, this is where new business can come in. Underserved markets, such as the unbanked, can start to get banked. So that's a huge opportunity for them. Also, small and medium-sized enterprises are going to be able to start to have some access and enjoy some of the things that the larger banks get to use. And basically, the small and medium-sized enterprises are going to be able to piggy bank onto larger blockchains that the banks will be running, and they basically rent that user space. So here are the benefits of having a distributed consensus-based ledger uh, in fintech. Again, we have more transparency. You're going to start to notice there's going to be a lot of repeat in tonight's discussion because a lot of the same things are coming up, but it'll start to really dive deep with you on basically how important all these repeats are. You're going to get greater trust between the bank and the client because you are going to be able to identify yourself faster and only once instead of slower and multiple times. Everything is going to get simpler. Uh, back office gets a lot easier, and the customer is just going to have an easier, faster time. So according to IBM, 91% uh, of banks are going to be investing in blockchain solutions by 2018. That doesn't mean that they're going to have them up and running. It means that banks have recognized the value of blockchain, and they are starting projects. A lot of tonight's presentation is going to have a lot of real-time case studies, as well as some old surveys that IBM did. And I'm going to be taking polling questions, allowing you to look from the basis of hindsight, how right were these smart clients when those surveys came out. So right now, current banking has a few challenges, and we're going to take a look at each one to see how blockchain could possibly help with it. So the first one is trade finance. If you recall my lecture from last time about the Maersk shipping, uh, this is going to be similar to that. So one of the challenges with trade finance, which is basically you could be looking at shipping things from one country to another around the globe, a uh, lot, of, lot of manual paperwork. You also have some stringent requirements, such as one country where it's exporting from could have different paperwork requirements from the country that is receiving it. 
as well as the countries whose borders it crosses through. So you could just have a huge bottleneck of paperwork where someone just didn't check a certain box midway through and your items don't get through. For example, when I was in the food business, I had items shipping from Finland to Boston and it was a pizza with meat on it and I did not have a veterinary certificate. And I couldn't understand from the FDA, why do I need a vet certificate for pizza with pepperoni? And they said it was to make sure that the pepperoni did not have mad cow. Since I didn't have that, my shipment was destroyed. So it was little things like this that I had never even thought about. So blockchain can take care of that by saying ahead of time, hey, if you have pepperoni pizza, you need to go to your vet first and get a certificate. Who knew? Also on corporate finance, letters of credit uh, typically are paper-based. So that can just simply be PDF'd and put onto the blockchain. And smaller enterprises don't have credit sources. So they may be able to access credit by being part of a larger blockchain. So some of the opportunities that blockchain can uh, solve for these problems are smart contracts can store and execute some of these details as well as the financial terms, wiring money back and forth. So for example, let's say I wanna ship something to Kevin Ellis in Canada. Uh, the minute it hits the dock and clears customs, uh, my wire to him can clear and be sent and he's boom, unpaid. So Kevin's thumbs up, thumbs up back to you, Kevin. <laughs> Good doing business with you. You can also coordinate trade logistics and payments real time so everyone is seeing uh, exactly what's happening at the same time. Uh, a friend of mine in Texas I saw last weekend, she works at FedEx and they have a product that uh, one of their partners has. It's a, a thing that goes inside shipments and it can ping out every hour uh, what temperature is, humidity, so you can get these constant updates on how things are going. Digital trade processes can get streamlined. Uh, larger firms are going to be able to afford to run their own blockchain and they'll have the option of making that permissioned or not. And then smaller, smaller ledger transactions for smaller companies can go to a shared ledger, which is called WeTrade, we.trade, and I'll show you a little bit more about that. So IBM has partnered with seven banks, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, and a few smaller, uh, smaller ones, where they're going to be making the platform called we.trade. And basically what it allows people to do is, let's say I'm a small importer, exporter, and maybe twice a year I get some carpets from Turkey. Well, I could use we.trade to get the benefit of the blockchain to see exactly what's going on, but I'm only using it twice a year, so I don't have to spend the money on that whole infrastructure. I'm basically renting parts of the blockchain. And here's another example of how the trade financing works. So just get out your popcorn for this three minute video. The following is a demonstration of how IBM is making blockchain real for business. In this beta application, we explore trade finance. These days, trade finance is a complex process that can involve many players. Ten parties with over 30 documents is not unusual. It's largely paper-based. It can be overwhelming. IBM Blockchain, employing the secure Hyperledger fabric, can help optimize trade finance and logistics and the information shared between different legal entities by streamlining the process, speeding up the response time, providing transparency and better flow. When a shipment of assets crosses borders, it requires approvals from multiple legal entities, customs, port authorities, trucking or rail transportation firms, as goods move between exporter and importer. The blockchain can be used to sign their approvals, notifying all parties that the asset has arrived and ultimately the money transfer from the importer to the exporter's bank. With blockchain, as soon as an entity signs the status of the asset delivery, then all members of a blockchain can see if they are authorized. And of course, to keep transactions private and confidential, there will be encryption for security. The Hyperledger fabric helps manage permissioned, secure access and engagement. The elegant application interface gives you access to view complex processes simplified into a single workflow, all accessing a shadow ledger. One of the key benefits of using blockchain for customer payments is that you can utilize more of your capital as it doesn't get stuck in long settlement times and errors or disputes. We know the document is authentic, it is secure, it's permission. The blockchain knows that and tells everyone that needs to know automatically. Processes are streamlined and made quicker as powered by blockchain.
Okay, everything sounds better British, doesn't it? Paul, I see your finger up. Yeah, so um, I think one of the things that uh, people, as you're looking at this and this piece of the presentation around trade finance, one of the one of the major resistance points in trade trade finance right now is that the goods are shipped in however long they take to get to their destination, plus receiving and all of that. There's no cash transmission to the supplier until that delivery is confirmed. And so what blockchain is able uh, allowing to do, especially with smart contracts, is allowing intermittent payment or periodic payment. Um, the total will be the same, but what you're doing is you're creating liquidity in the trade process. That is a multi-billion dollar improvement in terms of uh, the movement of cash. So that's why supply chain is so interested in this because they don't have to wait for um, shipment to happen, confirmation, transit, and then shipping, receiving on the, on the destination side. You can start paying in intermittently across the transit process. So that's, that's, a, that's one of the major cash improvements. So basically on your balance sheet, you're now taking a huge piece of your balance sheet if you're a manufacturer and you're actually converting it to cash much sooner. So and, so, yeah, and to Paul's point, when I had a manufacturing business, if someone, what could really kill a startup is a large order because you'd have to borrow a bunch of money off a credit line. So let's say Paul is in another country. He wants to buy whatever I have. Typically with, with markups, and this is super general, is you basically double it. I sell something to Paul for $2. It costs me a dollar. Uh, so with this scenario, I'd have to borrow a dollar get it all together, ship it, and then hope, I don't know, weeks, months later that Paul will pay me. Now what I could do is say to Paul, give me a 50% deposit, which basically covers me. We put it on the ship. It's insured. If the ship sinks, the insurance policy invokes to the smart contract, because once it sinks, it could put in a insurance claim. I get paid back. Uh, Paul gets his money back. And we're basically whole and no one's gone bankrupt uh, waiting for money to, to move in the process. So. Yeah, it really makes a lot of small players able to play bigger. And just, again, it's another way to grease the wheels. And I see Cheng has a hand up. Yeah, and that's, that's a really interesting point. But is there a way that you could put that money instead of, into like an escrow account or maybe have something on your smart contract that says once you receive the goods, if it's not what you wanted, the smart contractor, I mean, the receiving party, as part of the sub the smart contract can say, no, I don't want this, I'm gonna return it and I get my money back. Yes, Chang, because you get to write the, the terms of the smart contract. Yeah, I, and that's what, I, that's what I was just saying. You can either put in an escrow account or have some kind of escape clause at the end. Well, yes. so the interesting thing about that is the escrow, so I know that that's, I'm not going to um, um, uh, isolate your terms but what's happening in peer-to-peer -peer transaction or trade transactions, you eliminate the escrow account because that's a cost of doing business. And so what's happening now is um, today, for example, um, there are some very good case studies and I, I think Michael has them, um, right? And I know that we've got some of them in the syllabus. There's one with Australian lamb where, where from the time the container of frozen lamb gets onto the ship, smart contract executes, money is moved to the supplier. The ship moves out of port, money is moved to the supplier. The ship's in transit. So what's happening is you don't have it, you don't have an escrow account. Now what's interesting is some of the banks are, are having to, banks have been making an awful lot of money on those escrow accounts from a commercial banking perspective. So those are going away. So some of the activity that Michael's talking about is getting ready for how do we how do we maintain our same income structure our same fee structure and all this friction has been removed which has been a source of revenue for us for a long time so yeah. that's, yeah, that's a comment about that as well is is you're absolutely right especially with large transactions especially when not necessarily commodities but also securities you right. know, paying a few hours of interest in on the west coast when you're transferring money to the east coast it could be literally millions of dollars. So if you're getting rid of that, that kind of what you call friction, then, then right. yeah, that, 
that would definitely change the dynamics of those, those micro interest payments or whatever you want to call it. There will be winners and losers in the new world. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the people losing aren't happy about it. So, well, okay. I mean, I guess that's the point. I mean, you're try I mean, I guess it's supposed to be better for the consumer, but it, it seems like in every echelon, you're trying to make the financial technology or the financial industry still keep their 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 little fees or their little um, um, plus ups uh, along the way. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, so I think, I, but I think for you, so as a class, when you look at innovation, you there are small changes that can occur in a process, whether it's financial services, it's manufacturing, any of these, you don't have to solve world hunger to innovate. You can innovate in some areas and the use of blockchain applied smart, smartly will actually have a huge implication. And I think this is, as Michael goes through this, Think about atomizing the financial services process. And if you just grab one or two of those, you could actually change the game, whether it's for a credit union, a commercial bank, or for a large uh, retail bank. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so off to the next slide. And I have slides embedded to stop at certain points where I'm going to be opening it up to discussion uh, so that we give enough time for the people who are doing discussions at the end. So, and they're, and they're the following is a demonstration of how IBM is making. So let's go. So this one just happened, as you can see, March 15th. Accenture just got a shipping based blockchain project approved. And basically, this is going to be for InBev and it's gonna help them with European customs moving their shipments of beer around. Uh, so again, this is what, March 21st, 22nd. Uh, so everything is happening relatively quickly. Uh, some of the purists might not like this because uh, this, is a, this is a permission blockchain, but there are also blockchains where they're gonna be able to edit it, which I know is gonna be like scratching on the wall for the purists, but, uh, this is actually happening you know, right now and for shipping it just makes a lot of sense because it's such an antiquated way that they're they're doing business and these slides will be posted so you can copy paste that url to read the whole article uh, so now uh, we can stop for two questions or comments so just uh, raise your hand first come first serve otherwise we'll just keep on going gregory you're on the air hi I just want to go back to what you mentioned when you're saying that, like, while you buy stocks, technically they're settled at T plus two. I mean, technically you see it in your account, but like, I understand that it's a gain for the banks, but is it really a gain for the end, end user or the end buyer of stocks? I mean, that I see in my accounts that it's going to take T plus two to settle. At the end of the day, I still have to share in my accounts. It doesn't make much of a difference to me. Like, technically, I'm not sure where blockchain would improve from an end user standpoint, uh, dramatically the setup or the appreciation of the, of the banking system. Ah, okay. It makes, it's a big deal to me because most of my money is made from investing. And when I have that two day settlement at, on the Vanguard account, it messes up my performance and it gives me fake losses for 48 hours because the trades haven't been paid for. And it messes up the equity curve that I'm looking at. It also disturbs my ability to figure out whether or not I want to go on margin more or go off margin. So I have to make a separate spreadsheet for me to figure that out to get rid of that two day. So that's just for me as one private investor that might not fit for you if let's say you're a longer term investor, but I'm pretty short term. So for me, I like to have everything settled as quickly as possible. Because I work for a brokerage firm and the way we're set up today, like we're not affecting your performance based on the fact that we're settling T plus two. It doesn't show like that. So I'm just surprised to, to hear that. Uh, Vanguard.com, it shows like that. If I buy $50,000 of a stock, it's going to debit me 50,000 of my performance because the month, because the stock hasn't been paid for. Okay. Interesting. So, yeah. I, I've complained it. I've complained about it to them, but basically, if, you're, if I'm going to be T plus two minutes, that'll, that'll be going away, which I'm looking forward to. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And Kirtana, second question. Hi. 
Hi. So um, in the trade finance example that we were talking about, there's obviously multiple parties involved, like the, the shipper, um, say they're in one country, say there's customs of other countries involved and, you know, the receiver in another country. Is there like a common blockchain network that would need to integrate all of these and like would that need to be built and if so like wouldn't that be repetitive like every time there's a new um network uh you know there would something we would need to build something to integrate with that and then communicate with that and i don't know update uh or i'm just wondering about the update update and maintenance and the integration well, you'll see further in the presentation, we're going to be talking about some brokerage firms using blockchain and uh, they basically going to be having their own and it's permissioned and they split it up so that uh, it's going to be running faster. So they're not going to be having everyone running it the way Bitcoin runs their blockchain. If that mm -hmm. makes sense to you. Uh, also, uh, a lot of the data is not going to be necessarily on the blockchain. It might give data that says Michael McCarthy is an accredited investor, but it's not going to put up all the supporting documents that say that I am. Uh, so they're actually going to be streamlining all the data that they have, which allows it to run faster. And there's going to be some sharing with other brokerage firms, but not so much so that the, their competitors see a lot. Like for example, uh, one brokerage firm doesn't want another brokerage firm to see how many transactions they're doing because that would be an indicator mm -hmm. of size. They might just want to know, okay, yeah, uh, yeah, I can lend you that stock for your client at Goldman to short it, but I'm not going to tell you how much I have. So it's going to be this uh, on, a, on a need to know basis, but we'll be digging into that further. So, okay, that was our two questions. So yeah. So, sorry, just to follow up. So, um, would it be like, would the, both the networks be have the same consensus, consensus mechanism, for example, or would it be possible that, you know, one brokerage firm is on another consensus mechanism and then there's reconciliation effort involved? Most of the products that I'm seeing are being done on Hyperledger Fabric which allows them to do plug and play for programs that they're already comfortable with. And they'll be able to uh, basically translate that if you're effectively saying, okay, I want to, Goldman Sachs is speaking French and Bank of America is speaking English. They would be figuring out how to chat with each other. Paul, do you have any more, a better detail on that for Kirtana? Can't hear you. Can you unmute Paul? So I'll be more efficient in my answer the second time. Um, <laughs> my lip reading is, is getting good. I got, I got some of it. <laughs> really? Um, so the short answer to the question is a great question. Um, so what's happening is um, in the banking industry, you're seeing permission blockchain development. You're not really seeing public blockchain. And so a lot of the, um, we'll call them the dot-com equivalents, the, the newer kind of individual focused wedge offerings in the market have been going to the public blockchain. Hyperledger by design, um, and I'm part of the Hyperledger work group, so this is how um, I'm familiar with this. What they've done is they uh, purposely from a design perspective um, targeted the enterprise with a recognition that there had to be, uh, as blockchain became more mainstream, there had to be a, a legacy integration. And legacy is very different by domain. So legacy supply chain is very different than um, financial services, et cetera, et cetera. The target was financial services first, only because they were more advanced in terms of their thinking and strategy around and willingness to pilot, quite frankly, um, financial services uh, in the blockchain. So. Within Hyperledger, there are actually five different consensus algorithms. Um, so the ones you would think of, proof of stake, proof of work, but what they're finding is they're too slow. And so they're experimenting with three other algorithms. One of them is uh, point, uh, which you'll see as P-O-E-L, which is point of last of lapse time. Um, so that's another algorithm where you, because you're permissioned, I don't have to establish trust because I know who the parties are. So you don't have to, you can eliminate one of those transactions. There are others as well. I don't want to take any more of the momentum of, the, of Michael's presentation around that, but 
people are experimenting with a number of different consensus, consensus algorithms. One of the ones, uh, two of the ones that I would um, ask you to just put a note in your, in your, put a footnote in your notes for next week. Um, so I'm, I'm pre-selling next week's presentation already. Um, but uh, put in um, IOTA, and if Adam, I didn't see you here, so we can talk about IOTA later. later. But we have IOTA, and the other one we have is we have Hashcraft. Um, so Hashcraft, so that one actually is just launching now. It has an entirely different consensus protocol, um, entirely different. And so people are experimenting with these because they're trying to um, overcome the established bottleneck of the consensus algorithm activities um, to create blocks and then hash the block to the, to the chain. So that's an area of active exploration. And I think you're gonna see some winners coming out of that and they're actually going to be very dependent upon the industry. So financial services will be very high transaction volume focused, unlike say shipping and supply chain, which may not have as many transactions per second as you would see in financial services. So that's a long answer to your short question, but it's a great question. Okay, thanks, Paul. Okay, next up is digital identities. One of the challenges that we have is Clients are repeatedly having to provide identifying information, which is basically, uh, in a short word, annoying. Uh, as I had said before, when we all go to the airport, how many times do we show our ID? And by the time we've shown it the third or fourth time, you can ask the question, how could I possibly have gotten this far through security and not have my driver's license or passport? So it becomes ridiculous, but that's gonna start to go away. Uh, the onboarding of clients for checking accounts, mortgages, migrating from uh, one account to another through Know Your Customer, that's, gonna, that's one of the challenges that they have. What if you have a mortgage with two banks and you're trying to fill out the same paperwork at two institutions, which can get uh, cumbersome? And what if they don't match up because you made a little typo? So these are some of the challenges there. The opportunities is that blockchain can take identifying documents, put them on the blockchain with managed access and permission. So people might not know that, they might not be able to see Paul's driver's license and what his birth date is and where he lives, but it could have enough information that just gives a little green check that says, Paul's over 21 and he can drink alcohol. You don't need to know anything more about him. That's it. He's barely over 21, I'm saying. You're looking good. Uh, actual identifying information isn't really going to be stored on the blockchain. The fact that you were verified would be, such as you won't be able to see the details of my passport, but it will say, I have a valid passport and I have the visas that I need to go through the countries that I need to. Uh, this also supports the you know, your customer due diligence. And again, the customers have a streamlined experience. So I met these guys last weekend, Secure Key. They're working with IBM as well as the Canadian government. And basically the way it works in Canada is you go onto the secure key website, you choose the bank where you have an account, you log in there once. And once you're in there, then you can kind of like shop around like in a shopping mall. And if you want to apply for a credit card or a mortgage from a different institution, you can do that and it will pre-populate your account papers for you because all the information was already done at the first bank. Uh, this is the Hackfest that I went to. This is, these are my two partners, uh, Hanbin and Harry. Uh, they both work at IBM, so I had good teammates working for me. And then this is Daza Greenwood. He runs uh, the computational law area over at MIT. And we were trying to solve for the issue of what happens when you're in a refugee camp and you don't have any more identifying information. How do we know that Kirtana really went to Harvard Extension. How do we know that Greg actually has some money in his brokerage account to get out of here? And how do we know that Paul is a neurosurgeon? Maybe he can help out in the camp. And it was really interesting uh, trying to figure out the, the identity. And one of the people that helped us was the guy that worked at SecureKey. So it was actually a fun time. Uh, so before I move to the next section, uh, anyone have any questions? Is that a new hand, Kirtana, or an old hand up? 
That's an old one. Old hand, okay. sorry. All right, no worries. Any questions before we move on? Going, Lucas. Welcome to the show, Lucas. Yeah, so as I, more than a question, I just wanted to reinforce the fact of the KYC part. Um, I've been banking for a little while, and uh, honestly, uh, nobody really takes that seriously, as seriously as they should anyways, because you know, there's, uh, the, the reason by, why KYC is there is uh, to avoid um, conflict of interest and uh, you know, um, money's coming in or going out to the wrong places. So yes, absolutely, uh, you know, something like this additional identity would completely provide, um, would provide like a secure layer. Um, everybody is just, and I've seen it, and I've seen it myself many, many times. You just click no, 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 no. You know, because you know, if you click a yes during the KYC, while you open a DDA account, or we open whatever account, this is going to be extra steps. Um, and not only one institution, but at several. So it's just the reinforcement of that part of it. I think is it is huge. It's just the questions themselves are silly sounding questions through the KYC, regardless which banking institution you work with. So most people will ignore them. Excellent, thank you. And to that point, you just reminded me, one of the things that the Secure Key Guy, Secure Key guy told me, uh, he didn't like the way that I was gonna do the identification. And he said, you know, I do this for a living, why don't you listen to me? So I did. And what, they were, what they're able to do, one of my issues was, what do you do if you're nervous, you don't have anything, you forgot all your passwords, what do you do? And he said what they can do is a stepped identification process, such as, I'll always remember my name, I'll always remember my birthplace, birth date. So there are certain things that I will know. And yes, other people could know too. But if I keep answering all these questions that I already know, like my, the name of my pet, that kind of thing, where I went to school, it creates a constellation of identification, which would open it up to questions from the identifying body saying things like, how many times did you take an Uber yesterday? Which means they got to see my credit card account and they're not going to be revealing some of that credit card information because I might not be who I say I am. But by asking that question, I, it allows them to say, yeah, probably only Michael would know how many Ubers he took yesterday. So that's how they kind of step you into identifying yourself when you don't have anything. And I think Ferris, I saw your hand up a uh, second. Yeah, yeah, hi, how's it going? Hi. Uh, so I had the question, um, you know, I've been wondering, with, with all this stuff, uh, from digital IDs to uh, manufacturing and shipping, um, you know, what kind of jobs are going to be created? Are, gonna, are people going to have to, like, take photos along the way or, or kind of maintain and update records or, you know, and particularly for the IDs, I mean, today people have to take photos every few years. They have to, you know, update their information and somebody has a job to go in and do that. Will those jobs exist tomorrow? Will they change? I mean, or will there be additional jobs to just uh, validate? Well, it's a, certainly a fair question that I don't have the perfect answer to. Obviously, a lot of the old style jobs are gonna be going away. Like the back office people who maybe like literally, literally rubber stamped paper, that's gonna be going away. But let's say that you have a Hyperledger fabric blockchain for Maersk for shipping someone needs to validate some of that information, which is sort of like the digital rubber stamp. Will it be the same person? I wouldn't think so, but you are gonna be losing jobs as well as creating jobs. My guess, and, and Bill, I'd love your input, I think it's gonna be a net loss, but what do you think, Bill? Yeah, I, I think, Ferris, I think that's, that's where the data is trending. Um, and I, don't, I think we mentioned this before, um, I don't remember, but to maintain the Bitcoin software takes about 25 people. So when you think about the number of people that are, just take the software side of this, right, that are maintaining software in banking, you're, you're talking about thousands of, you know, thousands of jobs. And this software turns out is easier to maintain than some of the existing legacy softwares. And then when you add smart contracts to that, right? So add the smart contract, which will be doing some of the work. Um, 
I think you're going to see a, a net loss in jobs. But that, frankly, that's part of the value proposition, right? Because the value of blockchain is it reduces cost. And so to reduce cost, there's, there's several ways you can take cost out. And certainly one of them is to reduce, you know, to improve productivity of people or to reduce the, the number of people that you need to do the work. And on the flip side, Ferris, where some jobs are going to be created, uh, this was my first exposure at MIT to the legal side of blockchain. Lawyers are going to be busy. What do you do with, if there's a dispute and with arbitration? Is there going to be a smart contract Supreme Court? Uh, is there going to be a digital court? This, and is it okay to do stuff if there isn't a regulation, but you sort of know that it's going against the spirit of the law? So the, the legal people are, are actually really uh, quite busy, and there's a lot of unknowns, which that well, creates some jobs. Yeah, the other side of that coin, Michael, there's, uh, I think it's, um, uh, now I'm blanking on which bank is working on this. Uh, it's one of the London banks. Uh, so let me say Barclays, <clears throat> just to guess. And they're actually working with some folks in London, uh, uh, computer scientists and attorneys, so that you would actually write the contract, but the legal contract that you write would then get translated into a smart contract. So all of a sudden you have a, a vehicle for uh, taking, disintermediating the attorney. And that's gonna cost jobs too, right? The legal profession won't necessarily like that mm -hmm. uh, because there'll be few, there might be more attorneys, you know, uh, settling contract disputes but there'll be few attorneys initiating the contracts. And if, if the software is good and it's well-written, and I guess the software automatically takes an existing contract, you know, so you write the language and then it translates it into the smart contract. Now, I, it's not in production yet, the last I knew, but that's the direction it's, things are heading, Ferris. I was talking to a startup in, uh, at Brooklyn Law a few days ago, and he, I was basically helping him with the idea of embedding into a smart contract and arbitration clause where they would have Zoom and do arbitration because some of these contracts are written in stone. And what happens if halfway through you're like, well, I kind of didn't mean that. And can we talk about this? So it's, it's, all, it's all ripe stuff. Okay, let's keep on going. So I want to uh, finish up by nine for the rest of the group. Uh, Cross-border payments, some of the challenges that we're already aware of, it, it costs a lot of money. So imagine someone from Brazil is living in the United States, they're doing three jobs, they're trying to send money back home. It can take days for that exchange to happen. Meanwhile, the exchange rate uh, could fluctuate, actually it will fluctuate, but it could go against them quite harshly, depending on what's happening. Uh, the banking system's fragmented. So if you send that money from Bank of America in Boston, it could be getting to some different bank in the home country, and there can be some communication problems there. What do you do if you send the money and mama in Brazil didn't get it? Who do you call and how much is that going to cost you while you have your three jobs that you're trying to work? So all the time and the money to try to unwind these issues can be a real nightmare. And there's some very nice solutions around it. So some of the opportunities is banks are already creating secure, low cost, high volume cross-border payment uh, opportunities on blockchain. Uh, they're also opening it up where you can get into new markets and different currencies. I'm, I'm going to show you some startups that I've taken a peek at. Uh, errors go down and the transactions go through faster. So imagine someone who's working those three jobs. They don't have to wait, I don't know, an hour in a Western Union line on payday. They could just send that money through their smartphone. So uh, IBM has a blockchain solution that they were working with two companies doing slightly different things. Uh, one is a cross-border payment startup called Stellar, and the other one is called ClickX. So let's take a look at Stellar. Here's their website, and basically this is, allows you to send money home using your phone. Uh, it's super quick. You just put in your debit card or a credit card. Uh, so this is for crossing borders. So as you can see, moving money across borders for fractions of a penny. Now. Take a look at this website, and here's a little bonus question for the class. What is the website missing? What is it missing? Just raise your hand. Jeff Nicholson in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it looks like there's no place to log in, or there's a sign up, but. Okay. I'm used to seeing 
Okay, that's, that's one. I had another thing in mind. Okay, I'm seeing not FDIC backed, no dancing cats. True, good point, John Stock. Imagine that English is not your mother tongue. Paul? I'm not, so, I'm silent. Oh, <laughs> but do you see it? Yeah. Tell us. We're stimulating, we're stimulating the class to answer this question. Okay, I'm not getting any hands up. Uh, okay. that, so, the, so, the, so there's no bank on the other side. No bank on the other side. Also, what I noticed was there's no language translation. And the guy that cleans my house is from Brazil. And when I saw this, as I was preparing the slides, I called him over and I said, hey, look at this thing. And he's like, what is it? And I said, oh, you can send money back home. And he's like, uh, Portuguese? And I was like, oh, there's no language translator button. So I just thought that was sort of an interesting one. Tucker, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I was just going to suggest that um, it, it's fair to assume that it automatically translates like like many or most relatively sophisticated financial websites do now. I mean, they translate, they, they, you know, they can they can see your IP, they can anticipate your language. I mean, I wouldn't call it smart, but it's, you know, semi smart. Um, maybe that's what accounts for uh, um, it being stuck in English. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't see it. And Here's another start of working with IBM. This is called ClickX. And what this one allows you to do is that you can trade currencies peer to peer. So you don't need a bank. So I could trade some dollars with Jeff or Bill or Tucker or Paul, and they could trade whatever currencies they want. It's this place is this group is relatively new. They are live. And you can see they're just doing some of the smaller currencies and the Euro and the US dollar are going to be coming online. They're not there quite yet. So again, I'm gonna be loading up these slides. So these are some articles that may be of interest to you. And Rashalia, I see you have a hand up. Yeah, um, I wanna to add to that because I send money like every month to my, you know, to my mother. And then it's actually right now, it's pretty fast. I can send it right now, you know, on my phone. And then she can actually pick it up like in grocery stores, like su little supermarket or whatever she wants, I can send it straight to her bank. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's the technology, it's going, it's getting better, so. And what is the name of the service that you like? Uh, Ria. It's Ria. Called, yeah. And what are your thoughts on Western Union? Um, it's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me and more about really bad. Twenty-five dollars for you know whatever. I mean, obviously it depends how much money you send, but you know it's it's expensive. Ria, it's it cost me like literally like three dollars to send. So. Wow. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, thank you, Rashalia. You know, I'm really curious uh, when you did a Western Union transaction for say a hundred dollars of movement. How much did it cost you? Um, in so out of country, I think about. Uh, Twenty dollars or twenty-five or something like that. Yeah. For a hundred dollars, yeah. But then you have the exchange that they kill you with, because they will yeah. never follow Western Union. For example, it takes me only five dollars to send money outside of the country, and that's what they sell you on. It's only five dollars, so eight dollars, right? But then the exchange. When you look at the actual exchange, let's say I send money to Argentina to my brother. And um, the exchange right now is $20.74 um, pesos to dollars, right? They yeah. own the exchange at 17.49, right? So, you know, they, they, make, they, they make a huge difference on the exchange on it, but they only advertise the five dollars. And most people that I've dealt with in here, uh, a lot of migrant workers that come to my bank that, co that work in the dairy farms in here, they're never told the exchange difference. They are told, it only takes $5. $5 you send, you send the money, and they constantly, every week, their paycheck comes in, you have deposited on Thursdays, they come in, they take everything out except for the $25 that you need to have your checking account open. They go down to the right aid, to the Western Union, right, and send the money to uh, one to Honduras, the other one to Guatemala, 
and uh, but they never tell you really they tell you how much you're gonna get there uh, but they kind of play with the, that limited piece of information um, telling you basically it's costing you five dollars to send well okay. actually the, the the company that i use for i always check my rates to Rwanda, so they're actually really good rate like the one that i got it's that's really good deal like it's I mean, the bank actually might be charging more and the exchange rate probably more, you know. It's actually better on this company than the bank. Because I always do comparison before I, like, you know, send the money. And thank you, Rashaya and Svetlana. Uh, thank you, Lucas. Svetlana, what do you have to say? I just pulled up a Stellar in my a Polish browser and then in German, and it just directed me to Google Translate. Hmm. How does that make you feel, Svetlana? I don't care, <laughs> but I can see. I, no, I can see because I do send money home as well. So I would think that you know, if if my family doesn't understand what's going on, it doesn't make me feel make them feel very comfortable, or confident about the process. Gotcha. Okay. All right. That's our two questions. So we're going to keep on moving. So here's some new revenue sources that blockchain can create. Uh, some of the revenue sources are going to be coming from the fact that you have reduced manual processing, less costs, simplified activities, transaction times are faster, you have less errors, disputes, and frauds, so less arbitration, uh, less time on the uh, complaint desk. So let's take a look at clearing and settlement, which is a, a new opportunity that blockchain can have in fintech. So some of the challenges that they have in clearing and settlement is that you have lots of different parties who are involved in checking items. Uh, a lot of this can be slowed down because there's bottlenecks. Some people are slow, inefficient. Again, you get into manual work, paperwork. Uh, you can have time changes. You can have people who just aren't really incentivized to do their job and push some paper along from their desk to another desk. The opportunities that you can see in clearing and settlement is you could be saving billions of dollars if everyone was using it. And a lot of that is going to be you know, in saving on the labor cost. Uh, everyone's going to be having real time point to point transactions. So settlement is going to be dropping and auditing becomes easier. Instead of looking at that big pile of shoeboxes at the end of the year, uh, you could be having stuff that's already uh, kept up to date on a daily basis. So it doesn't become this huge arduous thing at the end of the year or quarter. Uh, CLS is a company that is involved in confirming Forex transactions. And it, it's actually pretty big. Here's the URL for the article. And they started this back in 2016. So this is, they, they've got a good jump on this. And this is their website. You'll notice that you can change your language as you want. And basically, they're helping with operational efficiencies and intraday liquidity. $11 trillion of cleared credit derivative business. It's, it's a massive business. So this company can handle 98% of all credit derivative transactions. And it's basically a major clearinghouse for derivatives dealers. So it's a little bit boring, but it's a huge back office operation. And they just pretty much automate the record keeping. So it's, it's boring, but it's big business. And David Gray, right on time for two questions. David. Um, so uh, this is, I, I, it's a little, um, it's, it's, this question's a little off topic, but um, when I think about my 401k, right? What is it about my 401k that takes a data clear versus my trading account, which is like a nanosecond? Do we, I mean, is that something that people know? I don't really understand why it takes that. And I mean, I guess one would be that Merrill Lynch, which is where I've got my account, that's more of, it's their products. They have their own strike price, I suppose, at the end of each day. It's tied to something, you know. My guess, and I'd like someone else to raise their hand and tell me I'm wrong here, is that most people doing 401k, it's, you know, buy and hold saving for a long time, they might just not have it staffed for that. And people with trading accounts, they just might have more people on the desk. Uh, anyone have a counter thought to that? It's just my guess on it because they could clear it as fast as a brokerage account because it's, it's still an account. 
Well, and what's interesting is, you know, to your point, I mean, it can fluctuate a lot in a day. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, it, it just seems people would still be interested in having faster execution. I just don't know if, what the root cause is of the big companies. Yes, understood. Uh, Sandeep. So, Michael, on your mind. A, a quick thought to that one. Basically, it's not a counter, but David, is that mutual fund what you are talking as a part of your 401k? Yeah. If it is mutual fund, they typically settle it at the end of the day or beginning of the day. So, that may be the reason why they do it on a daily basis. While um, for a trading thing, stocks, that could go uh, immediately, quickly. Yeah. yeah, mutual funds only uh, trade at 4 p.m., close to close. There's no intraday trading on mutual funds. Yeah, yeah. And was it Sandeep who I called on? Yes, yes. So my question was that uh, I, uh, my understanding is that we are talking about uh, transactions only, not cryptocurrency and blockchain when we talk about uh, banking here, right? Correct. We're not talking about Bitcoin tonight. Right. So if that is the case, then whatever distribution ledger we are, distributed ledger we are using to, to uh, record the transaction, the monetary transaction is still need to happen through bank. Is it correct? Say that again. So the monetary transaction, the money transfer finally has to happen at bank, by, by the banks. Whatever medium you are using, blockchain or, or their system. But since yeah. we are only recording transactions on blockchain, the money has to go out and in by banks only, right? Well, there was that currency exchange peer-to-peer -peer that I had showed where you could exchange your currencies. Like I can exchange my US dollars with Sandeep. And I don't know if they are going through a bank intermediary. Paul, are you aware of that? Are they um, using I think, I think it was a different question. You're asking, you're asking if the money transactions have to go in batch because of the mainframe systems for the banks. Is that your question? So may, maybe that is part of my question, or that, that is my question. But, uh, but again, to re, to reiterate, I'm saying in all the blockchain-based banking system that we talked about today, in which cryptocurrencies are not involved, the financial transaction has to be uh, uh, performed by bank only because they are the ones you are, your money uh, have your money. Because if they are not involved, then who is having your money? Because cryptocurrency is not being used. So when you are transacting with someone, somebody has to release money or get money somewhere, yeah. right? And so if, that, if that is bank, then the only thing you are changing is the, the intermediary player that, that is helping you uh, transact online. So can I, um, how are we doing for time, Michael? I can answer that question. Uh, we're, we're kind of pressed on time. If you can give a quickie, maybe put it in the parking lot, continue it afterwards. But yeah, we maybe can, let's put it in the parking answer. lot because um, it's important to understand the transact, the difference between receiving the money in your hand in the settlement of accounts, which is a batch process. So there are two different things that are happening, but if in the parking lot, we can probably go through the loop, which will, I think, uh, illuminate the question you're asking. Okay, thank you. Okay, so next one is know your customer. One of the challenges that we have is financial institutions are using multiple systems to verify who you are as well as different systems. And it just becomes a pain going back and forth between, okay, I already said that 50 million times. I already said that. For example, I'll complain about Vanguard again. I log into my account with my thumbprint. I can see all my financial information and I can trade. But if I want to read my emails, I have to type in my password by hand. And that's a little bit annoying that I was, they let me move my money but I have to get further identified and authenticated if I want to read my email. So it's, it's things like that that are kind of annoying. Now, the opportunities is if you blockchain the Know Your Customer platform, you could be saving three to $5 billion as an estimate by IBM industry-wide with the streamlining because you can consolidate all these documents. Uh, for example, how many times has anyone 
uh, here written their home address. I mean, it's been tens of thousands of times. How many thousands of times have I told someone the last four digits of my social security number? I mean, I could just repeat it. It's, it's, to me, it's not a secure piece of information anymore. So this is something that IBM is doing uh, on, where they're sharing on the blockchain with Know Your Customer rules. So this is uh, working with HSBC, Deutsche Bank, Cargill, where together these companies, even though they have competitive businesses, they sometimes will be sharing clients. So what they're doing is using a blockchain KYC where once you've been verified at Deutsche Bank, you don't have to do it again if you're gonna be doing something crossing over with HSBC, which just makes things nice and convenient because sometimes you have accounts with both of those places. So onto unlisted securities, this is where you get some challenges. Uh, a lot of things are still paper and they're manual. And when you're getting people like private equity companies sending you money to fund you, some of this paperwork can take uh, quite a long time to get that money in. And some balls get dropped when you don't get funded at the time that you do. I can't tell you how many startups I know who've been funded. And when I ask them how they're doing, they all know how many weeks or months they have until they go bankrupt. Like it, they, they have it in time. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, we've got six weeks left of funding before we need somebody else. So having things in a paperwork fashion don't work for them. It's quite frustrating that you'd run out of money if someone said, I'm gonna give you some money, but yeah, it takes two, three weeks for that actually to happen. So some of the opportunities here on unlisted securities is that you can simplify the tracking and management of the information. And you can also get some new opportunities for trading and investing. The London Stock Exchange, for example, they're creating a registry of shareholder transactions where it's going to be on a data exchange. So basically, they're digitizing non-public securities for small and medium enterprises. And basically, again, this is one of the ways that some of these smaller businesses can start to get some of the benefits of these larger institutions. And $14 billion is the annual cost of financial trade fraud that could be avoided through blockchain if they can prevent fraud. Here are the articles that you can use as sources, which I'll be uh, posting as well. And any questions? Right, let's keep zipping here. So now let's take a look at the early adopters in the FinTech space. Early adopters are people who come in right after the innovators that are making it and it's right before the early majority. So we're gonna be looking right here at this space at what these people are thinking. So the three areas of FinTech interest for this group, uh, which is 15% of IBM's client base, uh, they're interested in reference data, retail payments, and consumer lending. And I have an interesting video on reference data to see the kind of things that you can create and sell. So they expect that the blockchain is gonna help them save time save some money and reduce risk. Pretty much your typical levers that, that businesses are looking for to, to get better. So here's the IBM survey from 2016. Trailblazers are the early adopters and they were believing that 15% of them were thinking that blockchain was gonna be coming online in 2018. There was gonna be mass adoption in 2019 and then by 2020, uh, the final laggards were coming in. So I'm just going to ask one person to comment. This was their guess in 2016. How close do you think they got? Just one person, just give me a comment on what they think. Did they get it right? Are 15% of people using blockchain? I don't think 15% of people know about blockchain by now. Yeah, well said. I think it's it, people, they're, they're aware of it, they're investing in it, but as far as it being online, I think 15 is kind of a high number. So now let's take a look at the promises in blockchain. So I'm curious, just to just get a couple people to comment, these were the promises of blockchain. How well do you think they're meeting these promises? Meeting them, not meeting them, getting most of them? What are you thinking? Just raise a hand. Josh. Uh, well, just looking at the first one, I would think that interactions get a long way to go to hit the average consumer. It's just too, I mean, look at all, we're all 
theoretically uh, in this class because we're, uh, you know, let's say early adopters. And so um, it's still confusing to a lot of us. So I would say to the mainstream, it's, uh, it needs to be a long way before it's, you know, at the level of a PayPal or something similar. Gotcha. And we have time for a brief comment from Kevin Ellis. I think it's a little bit too early to come to a conclusion on, on that because there's, to me, there's not enough, not enough in the way of systems that people can observe. Um, be a number of private, um, private implementations of this, but in, in terms of being observable that way, I don't think you could get to a conclusion. You make a very good point, Kevin, that on the permission blockchains, they're probably not going to tell you that it's going great and we're making tons of money and this is just a wonderful thing that we're doing. So it's, it's pretty much on the public side that you're going to be seeing, uh, seeing that. So yeah, for, for some of them, it might be giving away their, their competitive positioning mm -hmm. and they just want to stay quiet on it. And, and then there's also, and if it, if it caused a whole pile of people to be suddenly unemployed, that's something that a firm usually doesn't want to advertise. Yes, the video I'm about to show is going to talk about something that you can monetize with blockchain that you might not want to let your competitors know that you're doing right away. And it'll become obvious why. Uh, so these are what the, the trailblazers were thinking in yellow, the early adopters. Uh, the, the majority of them were thinking that you could get rid of invisible threats or certainly deal with them from the little the small startups zinging in here. What is a surprise in the fintech space is a lot of big banks are getting into a blockchain or at least investing in it, uh, which has been a surprise that they've jumped in this quickly. Uh, also getting into the inaccessible marketplaces such as the unbanked and then getting that information more streamlined. This is what they're looking for. So now this, these are the popular rankings that the Early adopters were believing that reference data was going to be your biggest bang for your buck, then retail payments down to consumer lending, and then further on down the line. And I just like one person to comment. Do you think that this is a correct order that reference data is number one, international payments are the last? How would you change this order? Just one person. Kirtana, what do you think? Um, I would think that um, some of these items like uh, international payments and mortgages would be much higher up there. I mean, I think everyone who's taken out a mortgage know how many rounds of documentation they have to send and the same amount um, and too much information, like all the pay slips <laughs> that you've ever had. I don't think, uh, you know, mortgage lender needs that much information to or shouldn't have access to that much information before um, approving a mortgage. So I think some of those would, should be much higher up there um, than some of these other things like consumer lending or retail payments. Very nice point. Yes, we've already seen international payments. They're, they're actually live. There's actually startups that are actually doing that. And then on the trade finance, Maersk is already using that as well. Uh, Accenture just came online. So the, the order is a little bit different, but the reference data, I'm about to show you an example of how reference data can work. So let's move on to that one. So just watch this video and just notice how this could be a new piece of business that you monetize that your, your competitors might not have. So this is gonna be about uh, three minutes long. Uh, and it digs a little bit into the weeds, so the techie types are gonna love it. So here we go. In this brief demonstration, I'll show how we used IBM data science experience to analyze supply chain data from an IBM blockchain environment. We enhanced this blockchain information with weather data we obtained through APIs provided by the weather company, then trained and deployed a machine learning model for predicting shipping delays. Let me show you how we did this. The first step for a data scientist is data exploration, looking at data in different ways to see which pieces might be helpful in predicting shipping delays. As I mentioned, we're connecting to an IBM blockchain environment. We're pulling data relating to shipments from the blockchain state database using a CouchDB Spark connector. This connection returns JSON data, which is a hierarchical structure as shown here 
and we're working with this data in what are called data frames, consisting of records and features similar to the rows and columns in a database. To enhance the supply chain information, we also bring in weather data and location data that we've stored within the DSX object storage system. We join all this information together into another data frame that contains all the shipment, weather, and location information together, which we then aggregate and summarize for visualization purposes. Here we're using the Brunel Visualization Library, which IBM developed and which is now open source. In this visualization, we can see that when we ship from the US, the highest delays occur when shipping to Turkey at 11.8 days. Here's another visualization showing US shipments originating from California, Minnesota, and New York. It summarizes delivery delays and weather conditions at the destination on the scheduled delivery date. So for example, if I click overcast, I can see that Texas has an average shipment delay of 3.15 days when conditions are overcast. Or if I click clear, I can see that Oregon and Colorado stand out as having higher delays. Clearly these insights related to delays warrant further investigation by our supply chain experts. The next step is to use what we discovered doing data exploration to build a machine learning model to predict shipment delays. Let's see how to build and train a machine learning model. To do this, first we need to pick the data that we're going to train the model with. So in this case, I'm using shipment data stored in a CSV file within the DSX object storage. Then we use DSX's auto data preparation feature to prepare the data into a format usable for model training. Next, we train the model. We've selected delay as what we want to predict, and we want all the other features of our data to be used in the training. We've chosen to use regression as our modeling technique, and DSX can suggest several regression algorithms for us to try. Next, DSX lets us evaluate and compare the results of each of these algorithms and select the best performing model that we would like to use. Once I've chosen an algorithm, I can then save the model and deploy it into production, which I've already done. Let's go take a look at the trained model. So here's the trained and deployed model. And what this is showing is the REST scoring endpoint for the deployment of this model. So this is what we can use to call the model in production programmatically. If we want to test our model, we can click the test API tab and invoke the model adjusting parameters. We'll get back the result of the model invocation, but for this demonstration, we've created a website that integrates programmatically with the IBM machine learning service and this deployed model. Let's take a look at that website. So here is our supply chain application that invokes our machine learning model using its REST endpoint. I can select various shipping and weather related parameters Let's see what effect different types of weather may have on shipping delays. So first, I'll select that we're shipping from the United States to the United States, from California to Texas, and let's first choose clear and see what our model predicts. So our model predicts nearly on-time delivery, a delay of 0.2 days when weather conditions at the destination are clear on the scheduled delivery date. Now let's see what the model predicts if we change the destination weather conditions to overcast. With overcast weather condition at the destination, the model is predicting a delay of around three days. So with supply chain data from an IBM blockchain environment and weather data obtained through weather company APIs, we used IBM data science experience to develop and deploy a machine learning model that provides a REST interface for predicting shipping delays. Thanks for watching. To learn more about IBM data science experience, visit datascience.ibm.com. Okay. So I see Graham had his hand up first. Graham, go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, just so quick question. This is really cool stuff, right? And, and IBM has some really cool um, 
data visualization tools. I may have missed something. How does this, um, how does this sit on top of blockchain? Or another way of asking that question is, how was blockchain essential to what they just did? Because I've seen that, that be done with just data-based uh, info, and in some cases using Watson um, unstructured data. So how was that, was what, how was what just happened dependent on a blockchain solution? From my perspective, because I asked the same question, was if you're on the blockchain, let's say it's permissioned and we're all truckers in the United States. If I'm a trucker and I'm on the blockchain and I'm constantly plugging into how late my shipment is or how early it is from California to Texas, having all that new interactive updated data is gonna keep updating the database much faster because I'm constantly real time updating how long it takes me to go from California to Texas. So it's just the fact that the data is updating faster because I'm part of that database. Okay. That's how I saw it. Yeah, and that's, and that's totally fair. And actually, I think it, um, it reminds me of Kevin's going to like this, something Kevin Ellis mentioned to me. He's like, these aren't necessarily things that cannot be done without blockchain. Mm -hmm. A lot of this stuff that we're talking about is just stuff that works way better or is you, it's, it, it's more efficient with blockchain. So I think this is a perfect example. You could have done this with a database full of technology, but there would be no, you'd have to spend hours and hours and hours verifying the integrity of the, of the data, which is what's the stat, 80% 80, 80 of the time the data scientists spend on site is grooming data and blockchain eliminates the need for that. You have data that's immutable, already organized, and then you can, on top of that, add machine learning. It's a lot more quick that way. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Yes, and to that point, it doesn't create a new machine, but it greases what we already have. Right, 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 exactly. Yep. It's grease. Cool. Uh, Rebecca Prince, welcome to the show. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, I was actually, sorry I look silly, I'm very cold, but uh, I, I was actually just going to say what the conclusion that you guys came to is that databases are great, but you can accidentally overwrite data. There's the security issues with databases, with penetration, like pen testing and all that stuff. You know, so with blockchain, when it comes to reference data, yes, it could be done with databases, but that's where you look at the other aspects of blockchain, the immutability, the legacy of it, all of that. Great, thank you. Okay, so the Trailblazers, the early adopters, they're looking to bet on retail payments as well. That's another area of interest. And here's an article regarding, again, uh, Stellar and ClickX that we had taken a peek at already. Uh, here's an example of what's happening in China. So in China, they're already using uh, tuition payments and I actually have a consulting client in China on blockchain and they're doing this exact same thing Trying to use retail payments for tuition using their own token. I don't think they need a token But as you can see, there's just a ton of money in the space And I'm gonna start going a little bit faster. So I have enough time for the discussions. So uh, consumer lending is gonna be another one and Let's keep on going this is something that I saw yesterday, decentralized lending peer-to-peer -peer on a borrowing platform. So take a look at this crowdfunding that's going. First, they asked me, they follow the know your customer rule, and they asked me if I'm an accredited investor. And Paul, I'm just gonna mute you just for a quick second there. Uh, so I just said yes that I was accredited. Whether I was or not, they don't know. I just said yes. They didn't ask for any supporting documentation. So this is what Celsius does. You buy your coins, you put them into an account, and you can borrow US dollars against them. So this is called collateralized lending. Uh, uh, something that I do with my accounts is that I will put, let's say, $100 into a bank account. Then I go to that bank and say, okay, you already have $100 of collateral. Lend me another $100, and I'll go to a mutual fund with it. So now I have $200 for the mutual fund, and it's how I margin my money uh, at a company, at a mutual fund without going through a brokerage firm. So they're basically doing the same thing. And then you get paid to HODL, and basically what this means is, let's say that you want to short it, you can lend out your holdings to people and earn 9% on that money. So the basic idea uh, with the collateral side is that if you're going to be shorting, let's say that Rebecca wants to short Bitcoin. 
what I, and I had Bitcoin, but she doesn't. She has to pay me 9% to borrow my Bitcoin. So now I don't get the market movement of Bitcoin at all. I get the 9% from Rebecca because now I have a loan. She then sells the Bitcoin that I lent to her. She hopes the market goes down. She buys it as a, at a cheaper price, keeps that profit and pays my interest. If the opposite thing happens, she gets what's called squeezed, which means the market goes up. She has to buy the Bitcoin at the market at a huge amount. Uh, she could go bankrupt because there's an unlimited loss. And then I still have to get paid. Uh, so it's, it's basically they're just doing what a brokerage firm can do for you. But take a look at this. As of yesterday, 44.65 million of their crowd sale uh, out of the 50 million uh, was subscribed. And my guess is that they, uh, they got the 50 million. When I went back later today, it wasn't even up there at all. They didn't say whether they got the full thing or not, but they got 44.6. So I'm just gonna zip through these two questions uh, really quickly. So what I wanna do is just ask uh, one, one or two people. Back in 2016, this client survey went out to IBM clients where they thought that these were the barriers, regulatory, immature technology, lack of clear ROI, uh, raise your hand if you agree, disagree. What do you think about this? David Gray. Well, I think it's interesting that regulatory constraints is number one, when the reality, in my opinion, is that the regulatory bodies, they don't even, they, they can't keep up with the change, right? So I'm not saying, that the, I, I think that the impact could be at the top, but in terms of the timing, it could be actually last. Okay, Joe Walsh, what do you think? Thank you, David. I, I think uh, the uh, insufficient skills is the number one problem. Because if you look at all the different solutions that are coming up with, between blockchain and what everyone, and like even the hash and, and everything that's coming out, I don't think there's enough technical expertise in all these programming issues that will allow all these blockchain solutions to be fully developed. Because uh, although like, I. IBM might be coming out and have that, but does IBM really have the, I know that they've been downsizing and outsourcing a lot of their IT and, and programming department. Are, they come out with a lot of solutions, but I don't know if they have the technical background to continually innovate this without, you know, going that for many of their clients. Uh, Joe, that's a great, that's a great point. There really is a shortage of programmers. So if anyone's looking to make a ton of money, uh, Rebecca Prince, if you want to make a ton of money and get warm, <laughs> You can go become a programmer. So, okay, let's keep on going. This is an interesting aside that I sort of tripped upon is that Bank of America actually has a ton of patents in the blockchain space. So a lot of these companies who might not be using blockchain on a daily basis, uh, they see the value in it and they're investing in some of these patents, which I found rather interesting. Uh, now, most of these projects that I showed you are using Hyperledger Fabric and I'll show you the difference between Hyperledger Fabric and Bitcoin blockchain. So Bitcoin is using a permissionless blockchain. Anyone can join, no trust. Uh, Hyperledger Fabric is using permissioned. For Bitcoin, anyone can be a miner to validate. On Hyperledger Fabric, you have to be a member. Uh, on Bitcoin, it's a self-contained system. With Hyperledger Fabric, they let you plug and play some things that you know and love. So let's say that Graham is my Bank of America client. He likes to log in with his thumbprint. He's used to that. Well, I can still bring that technology when I put on my blockchain. I don't make him change to, let's say, a retina scan. Uh, Bitcoin has a scaling problem with slow performance. And again, with Hyperledger Fabric, I can make it go faster by saying, okay, I'm just gonna say that Graham is green check that he's over 21. I don't need to actually put all the data from his license to show that he's got that. And here are the six reasons why people might wanna look at Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, you get the permission, uh, you can scale it, it can go faster. Uh, even though you're part of the blockchain, I could make things on a need to know basis. So let's say that we are, uh, healthcare company and Rebecca is part of the, the blockchain, so is Joe, so is David, so is Graham. Let's say all four of those students are doctors. Rebecca might only get the dermatology uh, information. She doesn't need to know the HIV status of that patient, but Joe might be the infectious disease doctor and he knows that status, but he doesn't need to know that the client has eczema. So that's where the need to know comes in. Uh, you get much more richer queries where you can start to ask the database a lot of different questions. 
again, it's modular where you can put in, okay, I want the thumbprint, oh, I want the retina scan, uh, I want this sort of thing in there, I want that sort of thing. And then you can get a higher level of key and data protection. Uh, some people say, why permission? Well, the law. Uh, HIPAA, if you're healthcare, you're, you can't have an unpermissioned. Uh, same thing with SEC privacy banking laws. So, so that I can get the discussion people, uh, I'm gonna zip through this, because uh, this is basically just a deeper dive on what I shared with you. And again, this is on your slides. However, this I think is cool that you might be interested in. You can build your own blockchain for free with IBM Hyperledger Fabric. So if you copy paste this, uh, for now, I'm assuming that they'll charge you later, uh, they'll let you build your own blockchain and there is eight hours of tutorial data that will walk you through how to become a mini developer. So I thought that could be kind of cool. And I can take two questions and at 9, 10 in two minutes, we're gonna start off the discussions. 